Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we have an episode of PC Archaeology, and we're going to be taking a look at the IBM PC 5150. Yes, it's the computer that started off the entire PC revolution. Now, this is an IBM PC 5150, but this is not the one we're going to be looking at. This is mine that you've seen on the channel plenty of times before. The one we have to look at is one that was found basically in the trash and it was just about to get recycled and it's in rough condition. Who knows what we're going to find inside? So without further ado, let's get right to it. This thing was saved from basically about to be recycled. <laughs> and uh, I don't know anything about it whatsoever. This is exactly how it was when I got it. I haven't looked inside. I have no idea what the condition is. For all I know, there's not even a motherboard in here. But uh, it's got two floppy drives that aren't the original and they're not even screwed in. Well, that one maybe has one screw, but that one does not. We have the matching Model F keyboard and uh, <laughs> it's rough. It's really, really rough. I, I don't, I'm not holding out a lot of hope for this entire computer, to be honest. In fact, if we take a look at this, <laughs> this is the connector for the keyboard and it's, it's extremely rusty. <laughs> that goes for the top of the computer as well. Let's see if I can move the camera here. I don't know if this is rust here, like what this stuff is here. Yeah, that's got to be rust, right? Yeah, I haven't even tried to clean it. I don't know if that was the keyboard that was sitting on there. Oh, yes, look, it was. <laughs> that is exactly what is happening there. So I guess water was pouring into the keyboard and onto the machine. And this keyboard was just sitting right there, I guess. And I bet you, I wouldn't be surprised if this connector was sitting right there like that. And this is how it sat for who knows how long and water was pouring onto it. Now what's interesting, and let me just pull the camera down here. What caught my eye is this is an original Model A, the first version of this computer. Typically it would have the 16 to 64K motherboard in here. This is not the original power supply. In fact, it looks like there's one screw holding that power supply in. Uh, the original power supply would have been kind of a black anodized metal, and this is uh, silver, so that got replaced. But there is a motherboard in here because uh, I can feel that there is the keyboard and the cassette port in there. So the early versions of this, the Model A, the big distinction besides the fact that the power supply should be black is that there are only two case screws, one here and one there in that corner, which is missing. The later machines have five screws, so there's three along the top as well. Uh, there's also, I think, a stamp on the Model B version, the later version, somewhere around here that will have a B with a circle around it, and that's why I think people call this the Model A and the other one the Model B. Serial number on this unit is 223515. If that's early, I have no idea. Now, I happen to have a Model A machine as well. I should go grab it. The thing about my machine that I have is I bought it locally here in Portland. It was in very, very rough shape when I got it. It does have the original motherboard and that does work. I think I had to do a little bit of repair on it, but there was so much rust inside the case because it had just been a very damp environment for a very long time. So I had to do a lot of sanding and painting with rust converter and black paint and stuff. This bottom though looks pretty much in great shape, at least well, on the back it does. So I'm thinking that if this machine is in rough shape, like this top part's very rusty, I may try to combine the bottom of this machine with the top of my other machine because the top on the other machine is in much nicer shape than this one is. But maybe this stuff on the top actually comes off. Let me actually just give that a quick try. Wow, yeah, look at that. I don't know if like over here, this uh, this area here is actually the metal case here or what, 
but oh look i mean okay wow um yeah and even this rest right here i don't know um i am frankly shocked <laughs> really really shocked i think there's definitely some rust it's a pretty common problem with these top covers these spots right here where my finger are I think that is rust coming through. This is like a powder coated metal, um, steel or whatever, and it's powder coating on top. And it does start to get moisture in there and then seep through a little bit. But I may do um, some magic eraser and try to clean this up so I can at least get a feel or an idea of what the top cover looks like on this thing. So let me, um, let me do that. Well, um, I cleaned up in a way that actually, frankly, surprises me. There's definitely some rust here and there. It's popping through the case right there, but um, that doesn't really come off. This is, yeah, that is that is actual rust that's coming through. There's some slight rust there, there, and obviously over there, but the majority of it really came clean. And it makes this thing look, I don't know, not too terrible actually, kind of half usable. That side is good. And this side here, where you can see, it's a little, uh, what do we call it, drippy? I think all that like rusty liquid had been dripping down, but um, now yeah, look at that. It's not too bad either. Excellent. Okay, well anyways, enough on the outside of this thing. Let's, uh, let's take out the one screw that's on here. Let's take a look at what's on the inside. I'm very curious to know if it still has the original 16 slash 64K motherboard, because um, I don't know, those are kind of cool. The, the thought of a 16 kilobyte PC with just one six, 16K of RAM is just pretty hilarious. Uh, I didn't mention this before, but looking at the back, it looks like it's definitely been pillaged here. We have like a serial peril type card and we have maybe the floppy drive controller, but there isn't even a video card in this thing. So it's, uh, not in working configuration as it is right here. But let's get this cover off here, maybe. There we go. Let's uh, reposition the camera so we can all see together. Got to lift over the, uh, the things there. I'm gonna rotate this around so I can get the top off a little easier. So absolutely not the original IBM power supply. It's a KPI. Whoa, what is that? I'm confused. Okay, so the floppy drives aren't even connected at all. That is some kind of accelerator card. What? Let's get this floppy drive, whoa, out of here. So no floppy drive controller. And that's obviously a 360K, but I can see here, whatever this is, got RAM, there's a processor there. And down there, let me rotate this so you can see it. It is connected to the CPU socket. That is freaking awesome. I love cool stuff like that. To think that this was about to be recycled as well. In addition, here's the original motherboard and there it is, 16 to 64K. So it is the very first motherboard. And look, all the RAM has been removed except for the first bank. So it only has 16K of RAM. Almost certainly the accelerator card that's in here replaces all the RAM, I guess. So maybe that's why um, it was all taken out. Not 100% sure. Looks like um, we have uh, extra ports here that were not screwed in. So this card right here was the floppy drive or is the floppy drive controller, not the original IBM one. It's not even, it's not even in a slot. Check that out. <laughs> it's just sitting there. Um, <laughs> like it's screwed in. But yet, what the heck is happening here? All right, so let's take some stuff out. These are my two nut drivers from my original tool set when I was a kid. And I think these were basically designed for taking out the nuts that are on the original IBM machines like this. And I talked about this in a previous video, but I, I never knew what these were for when I was young. And um, <laughs> I mean, why? Why was this in the computer and not even in a saw socket? Oh, I just got a battery on it, but it looks like the battery has not leaked. Are we not lucky or are we not lucky? Wow, that is pretty awesome. Okay, so yeah, floppy drive controller, real-time clock. We have serial, parallel, and um, 
it's missing some of the nuts there. And another serial port and a game port. So there we go, okay. But this, this right here, this is the card that I wanna see here. I wanna know more. It has a normal screw in there. So let's get the regular screwdriver out. Oh, this is so cool. So, so, so cool. Um, just for ease of removal, I'm gonna get this power supply out of here. I'm gonna take out the single screw that's here. Oops, that's not the right one. It's, uh, there we go. Yeah, one screw. I wonder if the other screws don't line up. No, you know what's weird? I could see that they do line up there. So why, why one screw? Maybe this thing was like, I don't know, just thrown together at some point. So you take the screws out and then you just have to push it forward like that. Sometimes the floppy drive is interfering with that um, ability to push it forward. Then you can lift it up like this, unplug it there, take this out. Now we have this one additional floppy in here. It looks like someone has a single flathead there. I gotta say flathead screws are very surprising. Obviously there was a time when there was no Phillips head, I guess. And it just, everything about flatheads is so hard to use. I can't imagine that things were hand assembled at some point with flatheads because they're just so hard to get in and out. Why is this held in with one screw? It's just so strange, but there it is. The drive comes out. These two drives, oh, a giant spider just came out. Okay. All right, so yes, uh, crisis averted. <laughs> um, we do have poisonous spiders here in Oregon, brown recluse and things like that. So uh, a giant spider ran out of this thing and um, I can see some of the web and uh, stuff there left over. So, uh, okay, um, anyways, so what do we have here? We have a floppy drive. We have a sugar floppy drive with some spider webs on it. I have never seen a half height sugar drive. I don't think I've ever seen one, interesting. It's an SA-455. So the original SA-400 was the very first five and a quarter inch disc drive by Sugart. So um, this has a disc in it. Not sure this is in focus. I can't really read it, but it's like fract demo, like a fractal demo, maybe to show off the accelerator. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to archive this disc. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly do that right now, just to, in case there's anything useful on here. Uh, is there a disc? There's a disc in the other drive too, actually. Let me just open that up. I know you can't see what I'm doing here. I'm just pulling this out. That one doesn't have anything written on it at all. So I'm gonna quickly try to um, image both of these on my uh, other machine here, just so we can look what's on them and then also maybe make new ones in case these are failing or whatever. All right, the discs have been archived. This one with the blue label here was sounding pretty terrible in the disc drive, but I got a completely good read out of it. This one here, uh, there's one bad sector on it, but I read it a few times and um, that bad sector still exists. The funny thing is um, I can load this in WinImage and I see what files are on there. But if I try to look at this one, I don't. it doesn't show anything. So I saved a flux image of this one in case it's a weird format and it didn't, I don't know, didn't make the image correctly, I guess. So hopefully, uh, well, hope the disc seems to read. I read it a few times and this one seems to be okay. It was this one that I got a good image of that has the bad noise, which implies the magnetic media or material on the disc is shedding from the disc and getting stuck on the heads. It makes a kind of high pitched noise. When you hear that, you know you're gonna need to clean your disc drive after reading the disc and the disc probably had one good read and then that's that. I didn't even try to read it again because it read properly. Anyways, okay. Uh, back to the machine here. This other drive, the uh, this light color beige one is also a Sugar drive. So we have two Sugar drives. This is also an SA-455 made in Japan. Doesn't have any dates or anything on there, but um, yeah, it's kind of cool. It's got a JBC motor on it. All right, two Sugar, two Sugar floppy drives, 360Ks, very cool. The inside of this case is freaking phenomenal looking. There's a little bit of like spider debris and stuff, a few scratches and things on here, but really it's looking super good. When you put a floppy drive in here, there's two screw holes here because it's designed for a full height drive, right? On the later IBMs, there's actually a hole on the bottom of the case so you can screw through and actually screw in the disk drive. But take a look at this, on this early 5150 at least, I don't know, maybe the 
uh, later 5150s also had this, but the hole is not there. So when you put in the five and a quarter inch full height drives, they're only gonna be held in by two screws right here and that's it. The drive is just gonna kind of flop around otherwise, but I suppose they were very heavy and um, that was okay. And uh, same thing with this disc drive here, you just have uh, nothing over there holding it down and you just have the two screws on that side. But yeah, this case, other than being a little bit dirty, it's in freaking perfect condition. So with a little bit of a clean, this is gonna be a much better bottom bottom yeah this metal bottom part compared to the one i have because mine is just super rusty and to be honest this motherboard seems to be in really good shape too it's just a little bit dusty but it looks pretty sweet all right so what is this accelerator is it some kind of 386 is that possible i mean i can't really read what that is but it's got a bunch of ram on here and that's the processor connection and um I guess that's a Mathco processor slot right there. <laughs> I don't know, this is this is so crazy. This is so like really cool. I can't believe this machine, like I said, was literally about to be thrown into the trash uh, when I found it. So yeah. Next step is to get the accelerator card out. And we're gonna need to, I guess I'll just unplug this CPU ribbon cable here. I'll just leave that there because it's got a bunch of fragile pins on it. Here is the accelerator, and indeed, this is a 3D6 at 16 freaking megahertz. And with RAM here, let's see, we got MT RAM. This is 256K. It's definitely a little bit of corrosion right here. It looks like from spider debris, not, not battery leakage. These are 256K chips, so this right here is one megabyte of RAM. These are sockets that are not populated, so I guess for an additional megabyte of RAM, and if we flip this over, you can tell that there's probably more RAM. Oops, I get this into focus better. This is obviously more RAM right here. This is not memory right here. That is something else down there. But yeah, there's definitely already a megabyte of memory on this card. So we have two megs of RAM, possible of three megabytes with a freaking 386. I need to go upstairs and wash this thing. Look at that right there. A little bit of uh, grossness there. Looks like spider eggs or spider balls or whatever. So yeah, 83, 87 notch right there. Um, anyways, what I was trying to say is I don't see anything written on here about what kind of card this is. And on the back, it is the same. Nothing. Big fat nothing. And then here on this part of the back plane, there's a serial number, I guess. And, oh, I notice here there's a sticker. Let's see if I can get the camera to focus on that. It says Intel Corporation, made in the USA. Hopefully it's readable there. There's an FCC ID, which I can't quite read. So I'm gonna have to hope that in editing, I can bring that up on the uh, footage, that is. I didn't know Intel made accelerators for XTs. I had no freaking clue about that, to be honest, but here it is. So to think, this is the very first IBM PC with 16K of RAM, 1981, and someone upgraded it to a 386. Like, <laughs> that's just mind blowing. It really, it really is. Okay, I think what I'm gonna do is take the motherboard out, give it a clean. I'm gonna clean this thing as well, get the spider balls off of it, and we'll bench test this. I don't trust that power supply, by the way, as far as I could throw it. So I will not be testing that thing. We'll use something else for powering this up. Alrighty, we're back and I've given the motherboard and the Intel board a good wash. Take a look at that. It looks basically as good as new now. It's still untested, but before we get to that, let's just talk a little bit about this board. I took a few notes here. So this is a board from 1982, 32nd week. So it's not, you know, a 1981 earliest of early boards. The BIOS has been updated though. So U33, which is this chip right here, that has a part number of 151476, which is the very last BIOS for the IBM 5150 that was made by IBM. It has a date of 1027, 1982. That's the actual code that's inside the ROM. This chip date though is 1983, 42nd week. And I think this update was required because this is the first one, as far as I'm aware, that supports 
external ROM BIOSes on the ISA bus for like hard drive controllers and stuff like that. It also fixes some issues with the RAM. And definitely, as you can see here though, only one bank of RAM. So a total of 16 kilobytes because the RAM chips that are on here are good old 4116 DRAM. And if you populate this board fully, you get a total of 64K of RAM. The motherboard itself though is in perfect shape. After washing it, I don't see any corrosion or any issues whatsoever. The fact is that clock card was in here. In fact, here it is right here. I've gone ahead and I removed the battery from it, but there definitely is a little bit of corrosion on there. It got down onto the clock chip here, but it doesn't look like it dripped off the board and onto the motherboard, which is a good thing. Now the accelerator that's in here, this is the ribbon cable. I cleaned that up a little bit, so that should be in okay shape. Here is the accelerator board, and it turns out that this is an Intel inboard 3D6 slash PC. Now that's nothing super rare or anything like that. It seems like these were pretty good sellers actually, and somewhat common. So this particular board here is from 1987, 42nd week, at least based on the chips that are on this board. Now cleaned up perfectly. I did give it a good scrubbing with soap and water as well. Now the add-on RAM board here though is in really good shape as well. Once I cleaned it and got all the dirt off of it, it has dates of 1988, 24th week. So it feels like someone added this on after the fact. And remember there's one meg of RAM here plus the one meg of RAM that's on the board for a total of two megabytes with optional one additional megabyte or three megs total. I have some deoxid in here. I'm just gonna reattach these two boards together. I'm just gonna put some deoxid first. That went together very easily. And then there are little plastic screws here that hold this board onto the lower board. So we need to test out this motherboard first. I'll put a CPU in it in a second because I want to do bare minimum configuration. First thing we got to do though is test these tantalums for any kind of shorts. So I have the multimeter here in continuity mode and I'm just going to test across these tantalums here just randomly looking for any shorts. That's okay that it beeps quickly because that's it charging up. Wow, so far so good. That's not to say that these won't short as soon as I power this thing up. Uh, but I just want to make sure that there are no shorts now. Now, the power supply, I'm going to be using this, um, I don't know, US can, whatever. It can push a lot of current, but it also has overcurrent protection. So it should not just blow out when one of these uh, caps is shorted. Yeah, so far we're good. Five volt rail is definitely okay. I think we pretty much hit all the rails. So we're good, okay. If you have a motherboard like this and you wanna test and you don't wanna test all the various caps, all you need to do is connect up the connector here, stick that into the black wires there, which is ground, and then test against all the various wires. So if you go into one of the black wires, you're gonna get a, a beep, but you won't get it on the other ones. So 12 volts, you get a little quick beep as normal. Um, this red wire here is five volts. We're getting 13 ohms which is normal if I switch this into resistance mode, there we go, 13 ohms it is normal when you're testing against the entire machine here, plus the caps that are in the power supply. So don't think of that as a short. If you saw zero ohms or like 0.1 ohms, that would be a short, but 13 ohms is totally fine. I'm gonna plug in my post analyzer card. And what we can do is look at these LEDs here. Oh, I should hook up the speaker. I soldered the wire onto here directly because last time I was using this, I actually had trouble where the speaker connection was flaky and that was with the built-in wire. So I think I'm using a better quality cable there. Okay, so let's turn this on. Hopefully we get no sparks. There's no CPU in here, so we're not gonna get things looking good, but we're just trying to look at the LEDs there. Yep, the reset light goes off. So I'm gonna say that everything appears to be normal. Let me grab a CPU to pop in the board. I just went off to my little pile of chips on the side and this was sitting right on the top in 8088 from 1984. So we're just gonna stick this into the CPU socket. The other one is for the math code processor. There we go. All right, let's power this on again. All right, it's working. So the funny thing is you see how the postcode is, okay, yeah. 
Yep, it's beeping, it's unhappy because I think the video card is not initialized. So the postcode there is flickering, which indicates that there's definitely activity on this board. Now, the weird thing is, is IBM PCs and XTs don't have postcodes, not in the conventional sense. Now, if I pop out my little post analyzer card, I did a little investigating and I figured out that this thing actually works on three different addresses, at least three different addresses. So normal IBM PC 5170, like AT and later postcodes are 80, address 80. But this thing also responds to 84 and 300. And I think what's going on is the BIOS in here is writing to 84 or 300. If I plug in another post card, like this card, which only responds on 80, I don't think we're gonna see any activity. I gotta plug this into a slot that doesn't interfere with any of the chips. Okay, watch this. When I turn this on, we got some interrupt activity, but we're like getting nothing at all. Now the system is still working in the same way, but this thing will not display anything until something writes to port 80 and nothing is written to port 80. So the activity that we're seeing on this is actually just activity on one of those other ports, but it's a good thing because it tells us that this machine is actually working. I turn this on again and there we go. Lots and lots of activity. All right, so let's plug this in. This is a VGA card. Now I'm gonna make an assumption that this board here is already configured for VGA because it's probably what the previous owners were using EGA or VGA on here. I certainly can't be sure about that, but let's turn this on and let's see if we see anything at all. Nope, we're still getting the beepy beeps. All right, so dip switches here, five and six are the ones for the video card. Uh, it's five is on, six is off. I think this is set for CGA 80 columns. Let's just switch that one up. So we should be on VGA now, maybe. <laughs> Maybe it's not beeping. Oh, look, there we go. All right, this thing is freaking working. Sorry, I have to look off to the side to see it. There it is. All right, so it's telling us we have a memory error, but I think that might be, I, I don't know how it's configured. It might be configured for the accelerator card, right? Oh, it went away very quickly. Oh, why did it reboot? What, we're having a ROM error as well? Ah, interesting, okay. Otherwise it should have gone into basic just now. All right, so F6 ROM, I'm assuming that's uh, one of these over here. So let me just take these chips out a little bit and push them back in their sockets. Obviously the first ROM is working well enough to give us like some post activity. Let's see if that made a difference. Just sort of taking these out, putting them back in a little bit. I didn't remove those when I washed the system. No. F600 ROM. Let's take a look at what minus zero degrees says about that error. The 301 error and the 601 error, by the way, one of those is keyboard error because it's not plugged in and the other one is floppy drive error because it's looking for floppy drives. No, that's not found. And 201 is definitely a RAM error. You can get that 201 RAM error if the dip switches are configured for more than the RAM that's installed on the board. So if it's set for say 256K, but the 64K on the motherboard, or sorry, the 16K on the motherboard is all we actually have, right? Then it's gonna give an error. And I will need to look up what 455 means specifically. Minus zero degrees, I actually have the switch settings up. So three and four off and off is all banks populated and that's currently how it's set on here. And looking at switch two config, we have the 102782 BIOS. Remember, that's what I identified. Where's my post-it note? Wherever my post-it note is, somewhere on my bench, here it is, underneath the power supply. So yes, uh, yep, 1982 version, and it's currently set for 10110, and that is 640K. Okay, yeah, so it's, it's configured for the maximum amount of memory, because I think that's what the Intel board was giving this thing. So that's obviously why we're getting a RAM error, so I don't need to worry about that, I don't think. Okay, so I just switched it to 16K. Let me switch inputs here, or actually you can kind of see it. Are we still getting a RAM error? Yes, we are still getting a RAM error. So I'm gonna go back and I'm going to change it so only one bank of memory is populated. Three and four on and on. Okay, let's see if that changes anything. Okay, the RAM error changed. We still have a ROM error. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna put it back to the way it was for the, uh, the Intel board. It says here on minus zero degrees, if the ROM at U29, the checksum is zero, zero, then it's gonna display F600 ROM. So I know that that is the one to focus on, F600. Well, here's the chip, looks physically perfect, as does this socket right here. So I think whatever's going on is this chip is bad. I'm just gonna have to make a new one. And I'm pretty sure I'm gonna need to use an adapter 
I think, I don't think I can put normal EPROMs in here, but I can't quite remember. I have confirmed that that ROM chip is bad that's in the motherboard. It's this one right here with the X on it. I put it in the Retro Chip Tester Pro and it reads back with a checksum that doesn't really make sense. It's consistently bad every time, but it's definitely bad. So I grabbed a spare ROM chip out of a spare motherboard from another 5150. And I think the computer should at least boot into basic at this point. I also flipped the dip switch to disable the floppy drive so it's not giving the 601. So we're getting the 301 and we're still getting that RAM error, but that's normal because it's configured for 640K still. Let me plug in the keyboard. I don't think it drops into basic actually without a keyboard plugged in. So let me grab a keyboard. Let's try the rust bucket keyboard here. This is the one that was with the computer. Oh boy, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I just don't think this is going to work. What is this green thing right here? All right. Anyways, whoops. This connector here is quite rusty. So um, I'm just going to spray some contact cleaner in it. All right. Let's get that in there. And let's see what we get. I have a feeling. Um, I mean, that's weird. Now it's just frozen. <laughs> what's happening here? Uh, don't expect that to be uh, what's going on. Now, I don't have a hook speaker hooked up. Let's hook a speaker up. Maybe the thing is like beeping like crazy or something. <laughs> okay, it's going. It's beeping a lot. Let's unplug the keyboard here. <laughs> and let's uh, power cycle it now. <laughs> is it possible that a keyboard can like completely break the post process? on an IBM 5150? We'll find out shortly. Yeah, yep, it sure does. <laughs> All right, that keyboard doesn't work. Luckily, I went and grabbed another one here. Now, this other keyboard here is um, obviously in much better physical shape. It's not rusty or whatever. Although one of the problems with this one is it's been dragged on the ground, I think on its um, key side down. So some of the keys are really scraped up. I think I got a power cycle on the computer again. The keys are very scraped up. The case has some scrapes on it. In fact, when you type on the keyboard, I'm um, just touching the tops of the keys. It's kind of sharp. So that other one, while it's gross, okay, yeah, 301 error went away. <laughs> so the other keyboard, while it's gross, it doesn't seem to have any physical damage. So that might be a good candidate to steal some of the keys for this keyboard. Okay. Okay, so we're still not booting into basic here. Uh, I'm going to switch back to 16K of RAM and let's see if that makes it work a little better. Okay, no more RAM errors. Hey, and we're in basic. Sweet. So let's see if we can type. Yeah, okay, we're typing fine. So this computer is absolutely working. That is freaking awesome. Let's give the accelerator a quick test. I'm not gonna do an in-depth analysis of this thing because I'm gonna save that for uh, another video, one where I focus specifically on accelerators, but I just wanna know if it does work. All right, CPU connection is made and we'll just pop this card, which is very wobbly here, into the slot there. And the one thing I need to do is to switch this back to 640K which I think is that, because that's what this thing has on it. Um, let's plug in the XT IDE while we're at it as well, since um, with enough memory, this thing should actually boot into DOS. Now, keep in mind, of course, that this has now replaced the CPU. So if we get any activity here, like a initialized screen, maybe, we're not getting anything. Um, oh, um, yeah, we're not getting anything because there's no video card connected. I took that out for some reason. <laughs> okay, let's try that again. <laughs> come on, come on work. Come on and work. I know these Intel boards aren't like, oh, it's working. It's freaking working. Oh, that's so awesome. Okay, so as I was saying, there's no CPU in this board, so this accelerator card is now the CPU for this motherboard. And this is gonna be slow right here because it should be counting up 640K, and the BIOS on the original 5150 does not even have a counter to show you what it's doing. I think they added that in the XT, but 5150, you get nothing. You just get this black screen. And in fact, if the VGA BIOS didn't print that message, we would just have a flashing cursor, and that's it.
Oh, we still got a RAM error though. Parity check, ah! All right, I'm just setting these switches back. This is three and five here. Uh, I think that's telling it that it has a full complement of RAM on the motherboard, even though it's only got the 16K in there. This is how it was configured when I got this card, or got the motherboard, that is, out of the case. Now, one of the things is, I don't know for sure if the dip switches were even configured correctly, because I don't know what the state of the machine when I took it apart, you know, obviously had been molested and cards taken out, and who knows if this accelerator was ever working in here. So I couldn't necessarily trust that these switches are correct. Now, I did reference the manual for the accelerator card just to check, and for the PC1 and the PC2, um, it tells you how to set up the switches. So I think right now it's replicated on how it says you need to set them. Let's just see what happens. Oh, hey, hey, beep with no RAM error. Oh, it's like it's booting. <laughs> oh, all right, I'm holding down the shift key because um, my XD IDE has a bunch of config stuff on it. I don't, I don't, I don't want any of that to run. We're in freaking DOS. <laughs> oh man, let's let's look at the CPU. See what we get here. There it is, a classic 386 at 16 megahertz. We're in real mode, everyone. It's so real. Get real, just, you know, don't be fake, get real. All right, now with no drivers loaded at all, we're only getting, well, 639K of conventional memory. We're not seeing any of the extended memory that is on this card, but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna need those utilities and stuff. I'm not gonna dive into those details here, but just for curiosity's sake, Let's run speed 600 here, landmark speed test, and let's see how fast this thing is running. And uh, we know it's at 16 megahertz, but let's see what it is. 19 megahertz, oh yeah! That is freaking great. On a uh, original CPU on this machine, we would have got like one megahertz in there. So this machine is literally like 16 times or 19 times faster than it was with the original freaking CPU. Now, like I mentioned, I'm not gonna do any further testing on the accelerator card for this video. That will be reserved for a future upcoming video. But what we are gonna do is I'm gonna plug in this floppy drive controller here and we're gonna test out the floppies. I can't test because this ribbon cable's in the way. Gonna need to reposition a little bit. I have to keep the accelerator in here because I do not have enough RAM and I don't have a RAM card handy to bring this thing up to 640K so I can run DOS utilities and stuff like that. The reason why I'm plugging in this floppy drive controller here is I want to test those two Sugar disk drives that came with this system. Now, the original floppy controller that was in here, I don't really trust this thing because as you can see here, it does indeed have some corrosion. It doesn't look too bad. I could probably just clean that up. But the reality is um, I don't really like these multi-function cards anyways. So um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll deal with that later, at a later time. All right, so let's start with this first black disk drive here. Oh, okay, I just noticed something that's missing the terminator resistor, so I can't plug this disk drive into the controller on its own. Without termination, it's just not gonna work. So what I'll have to do, oh, this one's missing this terminator as well. Um, hello? There's no way these drives could have worked this way, at least that I'm aware of. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug the disk drive into the B connector and I'm just gonna get another disk drive and connect it up to the A connector. That's all that really matters as long as one of the drives is terminated. All right, I have both drives connected here off camera. Now the one with the terminator resistor needs to be powered because it's actually a pull-up resistor of five volts. So just plugging into the cable is not good enough. But I have the first of the Sugar drives, that's the one I'm holding right here, is set up as the B drive. And uh, if it works, then I'll switch over to this black one here. So let's power this thing on. Now I didn't configure the motherboard for any floppy drives. It's still set to disabled, but that's completely fine. The only thing we need to worry about is that the drives are hooked up. And that's because IMD just talks to the disk drive controller directly, so it doesn't even matter. And we're gonna do a cleaning process, so we'll just get some of this IPA here. Oops, dripping it onto the computer. <laughs> oh, the, the drive spins. Nice. Okay, we gotta hold down shift key. Yeah, so it's spinning on its own right now, just putting the disk in there. You might be able to hear that. All right, so this should be a 40 track drive. And it's definitely two-sided and double step is off. Now let's do a cleaning process three times. Uh-oh. No interrupt from floppy drive controller. There appears to be something wrong. So what it's doing is it's looking for the index pulses, which generate interrupts. We're not getting that. 
Let's try this disc in the A drive here. And let's see if this is a problem with the cabling. It could be a problem with the cabling. So we have to go settings, change this to A, clean three times. Okay, obviously we have a cabling issue here. I actually don't know what the issue is. The cable is my usual cable that I always use. Okay, actually I just had a thought. This reeks of a termination problem. Again, a termination issue. I'm gonna unplug the cable from the A drive and let's see if that changes anything at all. No, nope, it does not. Okay, so I plugged in a TAC drive as the A drive now. Let's see if that changes anything. Wow, what is happening here? I'm just gonna unplug this sugar drive entirely. And now let's try cleaning the A drive. All right, no, we're still having issues. And I know the drive that's plugged in here as the A drive, I'm having my hand on it, works. And I know this controller works. Okay, so I just reconfigured the cards, plugged everything back in. Let's see if that changes anything. I'm wondering if we're dealing with a fault here. I forgot what interrupt the floppy drive controller uses, but it's quite possible that that interrupt is just uh, bad on this motherboard. Maybe the interrupt controller, which is one of the ICs, is not working anymore. I could actually plug in this postcard, the one we had earlier, because it actually has LEDs to show you what interrupts are in use. Quick Google reveals that the timer is interrupt zero, the keyboard is interrupt one, and the keyboard's working perfectly, and the floppy disk there is interrupt six. So I need to try to get this post controller into this board so we can see if we're at least seeing that interrupt six. I mean, maybe this floppy drive controller broke. I don't know, anything is actually possible. And this postcard here starts to interrupt three, so it doesn't even bother with zero, one, or two. Alrighty, so the interrupt that came on there, we can ignore, because it's three, four, five, six, seven. These ones are all for 16-bit systems, and the 16-bit slot cover here is just hanging out of the board. In fact, I think just touching it turned on those lights. So ignore those, those are floating. We gotta look at those here. You know, maybe the problems I'm having is that IMD doesn't work on the 5150. I mean, that's quite possible. I don't know if I've ever tried it before, so that might be the issue. There could be all sorts of different issues, but um, yeah, it's kind of funny here. Something that should be quick and easy. Oh, look at that. So three, four, five, six, interrupt six is the floppy controller. I think we have a reset button here. That clears those. There we go. Yeah, it came right on. All right, so let's see. Let's think about what's going on here. The interrupt, the physical interrupt on the ISA bus is being seen. So that's coming from the floppy drive controller. It's sending interrupts, I think, with each of the pulses from the index sensor. Now on the IBM PC, if we talk architecturally, and this is just off the top of my head, uh, the interrupts go to an interrupt controller, like one of these larger ICs on the board, and then that makes its way, the output of that makes its way into the CPU. So the CPU socket is able to tell which interrupt it is. It doesn't just have seven interrupt lines for the 8088. It actually has like a little multiplex thing going on. So we know the interrupts are kind of working because the keyboard is obviously functional right now and it wouldn't be if it wasn't for interrupt zero. But then the software routine here in IMD is not able to see the interrupt. So the CPU, which is on the accelerator card in this case, isn't seeing it. So I have one idea and I'm just gonna flip the switch one here on the board. And what that is, is the floppy drive. Yes, there is a floppy drive switch that exists on the IBM 5150. Maybe for some reason with that switch off, then the interrupts are cut off from the CPU or the interrupt handler. I don't know, that's a possibility. Let's just see if that makes a difference. And I think if I can't get this fixed or working shortly, I am just going to switch to another motherboard and quickly test these drives. I just wanna rule them out as working or non-working. I mean, the interrupt problem is separate from the drive problem. The A drive just seek, but not the B drive. So this must be configured for just one floppy drive. And the funny thing is actually there was no error and you would almost think there's the light on by the way, so we can switch that away. All right, let's try cleaning here. It freaking works. Okay, um, my only hunch is that that <laughs> dip switch one like disconnects the interrupt or something. <laughs> Oh, the things that I don't know about the IBM 5150. That is pretty hilarious. All right, well, anyways, I'm putting the clean disk into the B drive here, which is the sugar drive. And we're just changing the settings here. We're doing clean, three passes. It's seeking normally, so that's a good sign. All right, I have a 360K disk right here. Let's pop this in the drive that I just cleaned, and we're gonna do a line. 
Now, I recently had a video on the second channel, a long video of me testing a bunch of disk drives. I go through all the methodology I'm using to test, so I'm not gonna talk about it here. It's exactly what I'm doing right here. Go watch that video if you're interested to know how I do it. But so far, so good. Let's see, there we go. Okay, all looks good here on this disk drive. And it's a pretty quiet drive too, which is nice. Thank you, Sugart, for that. Yep, it's a 40 track drive or 48 tracks per inch. And um, it's working well, excellent. All right, I am gonna hot swap the drive over from this one to the black drive here, the other one that was in that machine. Gonna have to do the cleaning process. So a little IPA on the disc, clean three times. Seeking normally, excellent. All right, let's swap in the 360K disc here, which we used on the other drive. We do align and let's see what happens. All right, looking good. Seeking to different tracks. That's 40, so there's nothing there. Go back one, it looks good. We hit H for head, looks excellent. Just in case anyone was curious, let's do a quick test of the RPM. This thing has a servo type motor, so it's gonna be 300 RPM pretty much dead on and it absolutely is very nice. Alrighty, so this motherboard here, all that was wrong with it, well, at least as far as I could tell, bad ROM chip. So I'm gonna put a check mark on here somewhere. Where should I put it? I don't wanna write over any of the uh, IBM marks that are on here. Like there's these stamps there and there. So I'm just gonna put a little tick mark in the corner right here. This Sharpie does come off with IPA if needed. So that board is awesome and it looks perfect. Zero corrosion fully functional from 1982. IBM made really good stuff. Next up, we have the two floppy drives that were in here. So I'm just gonna write a tick mark on here and there. So these are both 360 and they are 48 TPI. Awesome, two fully functional half height sugar drives. It's too bad they are not the same color because it would be sweet to have two of these in black here. That way I could stack them inside like an IBM XT and then put the hard drive over on the other side. But either way, they work and that's awesome. All right, we're getting near the end here. Why don't we open up this keyboard here? Let's just take a look at the carnage inside of it. All right, there we go. That's interesting. So the little green thing I saw, there was like a felt pad, someone stuck on there. If we look at the inside here, there's definitely water ingress, but you know what? I mean, it might not have drained like through the keyboard itself. Now looking at the controller board, things look okay. That is very sticky and leaving horrible residue on my fingers. The spring over on this side looks okay. There's a bit of spider web activity there. Uh, this one looks a little bit more corroded. This is pretty interesting here. It was clicked by KP. It was buttoned by BS and tested it. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. This is really, this is quite cool. Turning the keyboard over, it falls out. The base plate is actually okay. This foam on the other hand is not okay. So I'm just gonna peel that away. Oh, it's degrading so horribly. It would be my assumption if water was pouring into this thing the whole time, that we would actually have a lot of rust on the base plate here. I'll just pop a key off here. Yeah, I mean, that's not bad at all. Not even a little bit. Like, I'm shocked. Yeah, this thing, I wonder why it's not working. Could be the cable, to be honest. The keys seem to be in okay shape. I mean, they're just dirty. It certainly clicks properly. Look at this rubber residue all over my fingers. Is that underneath the entire base plate? I've never taken apart one of these all the way. I see the rubber over here and over here. So maybe it's it's underneath this whole thing and um, the foam has degraded and actually got all over the contacts. Although I don't know why that would keep the computer from posting. This keyboard connector is in very sad shape, although it looks like it is something I could just cut and reattach. I'm not gonna try to fix this keyboard because that in and of itself is an entire video. So I think I'm just gonna put this thing back together and leave it for another day. If you're a Model F expert, Definitely let me know, uh, especially about this foam and the problem where it was keeping the computer from posting. 
And if this thing can be revived, like maybe it's just a bad cable here, like this connector needs to be replaced or there's something going on inside the keyboard, I would love to hear your opinions on that because I've never really worked on one of these. I've have, I have a few of these keyboards and they all work. I've never had any problems with them not working like this one, but this one was clearly abused very badly. Uh, just in case anyone wants to know on the inside of the keyboard, there it is, December 9th, 1981, Inspector 54. Alrighty, the last thing we need to look at is this power supply, the old KPI. Let's get the cover off this thing. Let's take a look how it looks on the inside. So far, I've taken out six screws and there are at least two more on the side here. So this is a very screw heavy power supply. It's not light either. It's um, you know pretty thick metal. I did clean it up a little bit, which is why it kind of looks like, like that. All right, there we go. That came apart now. Wow, this thing. <laughs> It doesn't seem too badly built inside here. No reefas. There are regular polymer filter caps there. This thing does have a voltage switch right here. It's set for 110 volts on off. Um, I do have to say, do not open a power supply, by the way, unless you know exactly what you're doing. These main caps here can store a wallop, like 400 volts, 300 something volts. If you touch the bottom side and you don't discharge those, there's probably a discharge resistor right here, but you can't always rely on that to be working. But yeah, no refus. There's a possible refa or these ones here, but these are actual polymer caps. So they're not the type that will go bang. We have an adjustment pot right there, that little yellow thing. I mean, it's not too dirty inside. I mean, it is a bit dirty, but not too bad. Now I've talked about this before, but generally like this little section here is the voltage regulation, a switching controller for the switch mode power supply. If the power supply doesn't start up, it can often be like this cap right here. See how it's really close to this, um, this component here, which obviously gets hot because it's a big heat sink. That'll bake this cap and it will lose its capacitance, which can prevent the controller from starting up. And you might need to change that little cap. Sometimes these as well, but see they're much further away from the heat source. In fact, uh, this is this one. <laughs> That's pretty close to the heat source. Not awesome there, but uh, yeah, anyways, this would be the most suspect cap if the thing does not start. I do have to say there's like a bunch of brown looking gunk around over here and that's a little suspicious, but generally if these caps have leaked, you'd see it around them as well. And this maybe it's just like flux residue that made its way onto the top side of the board. Same with right there. All right, I hooked up some light bulbs to this power supply. One day I'll get something better for low testing than this, but uh, this is something at least. I have one of these hooked up to five volts, one hooked up to 12 volts. As I just mentioned, don't do this unless you know exactly what you're doing. I'm plugging in mains into this thing and uh, that is dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. Here we go. All right, we're getting 4.9 volts on the five volt rail. Let's see what we're getting on the 12 volt rail. I'm gonna turn this off while I move this over because the connections are a bit sketchy. Oh, wait a second. I was only plugged into the five volt rail there. I didn't have anything on the 12 volt rail. Let's try that again. Ooh, that's very bright. So we're getting 11.2 volts on the 12 volt rail and on the five volt rail again. Yep, 4.9 volts. Okay, let's move it all back to five volts so we don't get blinded as much. So we're getting 4.9 volts. The fan's not running because the fan's not hooked up. I was like, what's happening? I'm just gonna adjust the five volt regulator up slightly here. There we go. The pot's pretty good. It's not too scratchy. It's also not too sensitive. Now the regulation that's on these power supplies does regulate the five volts and the 12 volt rail and the other the rails like the minus five and the minus 12 is derived from the main five volt regulation. So as the five volt gets loaded down, the regulation circuit will like boost it up or whatever, and that will cause the other rails to fluctuate more. But those other rails aren't really that important. I mean, they're used for biases and stuff like that and motors and things like that. So the fact that those aren't exactly right, like 11.5 volts, or even if it's like 12.9 or whatever, totally fine. I think it's like plus or minus 10%. So 12 volts can be like 13.2 and minus, you know, whatever. And that's still totally within spec. So cool, I'm just gonna let this run for a little while just like this and we'll come back in several minutes and just see if we're still at a nice five volts. All right, I went and grabbed my original 5150, the one I said was rusty and indeed the back of the case, which I know you can't really see very well. Oh, this machine is heavy. This has all been sort of repainted. I did paint around the labels, that way they're not messed up. 
but ultimately, yeah, there's um, there's some rust on the inside, if I recall. The bottom has some paint work as well. Original power supply is in this machine. It's a black one and it's in good shape. It does work. So the bottom of the machine that we're testing today is much nicer than this one. So I'm definitely gonna be doing the swap. But the top part of this one, oh, is in pretty good shape. It's got like a few little marks here and there, but ultimately looks pretty good. When it comes to the front bezel, mine has a couple little chips and things on it, but so does the other one. So I don't think there's really much difference. This is a dual floppy drive version. Um, I have one IBM drive in here and the other one, whoa, <laughs> the other one is not IBM. <laughs> the drives are all lubed up and very easy to operate. And on the bottom, again, these have the two original cork feet. Oh, wow. This has the hole for getting to the disk drives, which the other one doesn't have. So my assumption is the other one is actually maybe an older case. The bottom at least is older because this has the hole, but this is absolutely one of the uh, early versions because it does not have the screw holes or the holes here for the, uh, the three extra screws on the top. So anyways, yeah, I think that's what I'm gonna be doing. A bunch of swapping. And here it is, we're at 5.09 volts. This thing, I feel some warmth coming off of it now. It has been running and is working. So we're gonna unplug the mains here. So you know what? That's kind of cool this power supply works. It's in decent shape, all things considered. All right, there we have it. And everything freaking works. Well, everything except for the ROM chip on here. That was bad. And I ended up stealing that ROM chip off this IBM 5150 motherboard, which is the one I did a repair on, on the main channel. What was that like several months ago? So I'll need to figure out a solution to replace this chip. It requires a little adapter because this is a 2364 and to use a 2764 EEPROM, a little PCB adapter is required. And one of the problems actually with using an adapter is that raises up the height, which can interfere with ISA slots. And we only have five slots on here. So there's not a whole lot of slots free to be wasting on adapters. So I'll have to figure out a solution for that, but that'll be for a future time. I am stoked to have found this Intel inboard 386 PC in that machine. And considering this was about to be shredded and this accelerator totally works, that would have been a travesty. I mean, it's bad enough that an original 5150, one of the A versions or PC ones with only 16K was about to be shredded, but also these cards aren't gonna be the most common. There's probably a lot more IBM PCs out there than there are these. So it's really great to have saved this stuff. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, thumbs up, all the usual stuff. Huge thanks to my patrons. They make it possible that I do this full time now. So thank you very much to all of them, especially all the new patrons that have arrived recently. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. And if you wanna see your name here, scroll up the side of the screen, there's a link in the description below. Patrons get early access to videos, all the usual stuff. And yeah, you know, YouTube stuff, thumbs up, all the et cetera stuff. And uh, by the way, subscribes really, really help creators. It just takes a second, and if you do that, um, that would be awesome. So anyways, that's going to be it. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.